Okay now. Okay. Start. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Magandang hapon po sa inyo. Maayong hapon sa inyo tayo. Welcome to another episode of Wild Bruce, and uh, this is episode three. Uh, Wild Bruce is an online biodiversity talk. It's a, like a talk show of the Biodiversity Conservation Society of the Philippines, or BCSP. We are live, and it is now 4.01 p.m. on a nice and cloudy Saturday, 24 October 2020. We have a very special guest this afternoon, and it is such a great honor for me to serve as a host and to have this conversation with him. Although we we're, we'll be having a few more uh, guests, um, surprise guests. And the generation of today, the millennials and the Gen Z Zers, um, your generation, may have a word to describe our special guest, uh, influencer, which in its modern day usage roughly means an icon or even a rock star. Today we will meet one such influencer, or what my generation, I'm a Gen X, um, I belong to the Gen X, uh, calls a role model. Uh, diba? Very exciting word, role model. Uh, Isaac Newton, <laughs> Isaac, sorry, Isaac Newton, which I am sure many of you know, uh, summarized scientific advancement in his famous quote, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And we will meet one such giant of the scientific community in the Philippines in this episode. Uh, so before we meet him, before natin tawagin ng ating special guest, um, uh, I, I need to uh, mention all of this first. While Bruce is being brought to you by the BCSP. And of course, BCSP is uh, by, by Diversity Conservation Site of the Philippines. It is an organization of biodiversity researchers, managers, scientists, and conservationists. BCSP was formed in 1992, actually, with the fervent desire to advance wildlife research and conservation in the Philippines through mentoring, uh, promoting research, and public awareness. And I like to mention also, since we have a lot of time, uh, the BCSP officers and board members are, members are the following. 
uh, the president is Rainier Manalo, the vice president is Cynthia Layusa, our secretary is Apolin Apolinario Carino, C. Paul, and um, the treasurer is Aris Aguinaldo, Marami Pato, sorry. Uh, board members are Johnny Akai, May Lowy Diesmos, Desemarie Anton, Antoinette Fernandez, Jason Ibanez, Indira Lacerna Widman, Lisa Paguntalan, Emerson C., Don Jock Tabaranza, William Van Deven, Maria Nancy Ibuna, and Edmond Leyer Rico. I'd also like to mention that our guest is a founding member of uh, the BCSP or the Wildlife Conservation Society of the Philippines um, in the olden days, along with Carlo Custodio, Lawrence Hini, and uh, who, who was our guest in the last episode, and Blasta Baranza Jr. Uh, Wild Bruce uh, is uh, being brought to you by um, the purveyors of Wild Bruce are the following, Cynthia Layusa, Michelle Encomienda, Cides Fernandez, Giselle Delardo, Francis May Tenorio, Si Abigail De La Yola, J. Khalil Panopio, Prime Premne, Harold, uh, and Harold M. Nasset. Okay, since that is out of the way, uh, here's our game plans. Uh, like before, we have three segments. Uh, we will be flashing them, those segments, soon. Can we flash those segments, those, uh, Michelle? Young three main segments. Aaron, hello. Yeah. Michelle, can you hear me? <laughs> anyway, you can key in your abang hinahanap pa yung segments being put on the screen. Uh, you may key in or your questions at the chat box. And this uh, this episode is uh, again live on Facebook and also on YouTube. You can you can find the BCSP um, broadcast over YouTube. And now that is out of the way, uh, Michelle, can we show the segments, if you could, the three segments, para we have a game plan to show the our audiences for today. Michelle? OK, mamaya na siguro, sir, ha? <laughs> and uh, siguro, I'll, I'll show up. Uh, let me mention Muna Yung a special guest. Uh, let me introduce you briefly. Uh, briefly sorry. Um, uh, Angel Chua Alcala, um, or Angel Alcala, and uh, he, he is actually widely known as ACA, ACA, is a national scientist. He was conferred uh, the Order of uh, National Scientist in 2014 by uh, the president of the, the, the Philippines. Um, and he was also an, an NAST academician, uh, conferred um, with the rank in 2004. NAST is the National Academy of Science and Technology. He also received a Pew Fellowship in 1999. And of course, he was a Ramon. He is a Ramon Magsaysay Award for Government Service Awardee in 1992. He has done so much. He has a lot of awards. Uh, basically, he's a man of science. He established the Marine Science Lab in 1990, 1974, and then the uh, Siliman University Angelo King Center for Research and Environmental Management in 1999, among many, many other accol accolades and uh, accomplishments. So, Sugura, for so we can start now. Uh, we will start with segment one. Uh, Michelle, if you could show our guest na. Pag hindi makita. Okay, ang ating segment one is about origins. And uh, we will be asking questions kay Sir, kay Sir Aka. And um, basically, uh, uh, Sir Ma, yung hapon pa. Uh, uh, we will be, yeah, we will be, this is, this will be like a, a conversation lang, and then, yeah, yeah uh, this will be casual, although kinakabahan ako, so, <laughs> there are, uh, yeah, it's always good to see you, sir, and, um, and uh, we hope you are doing well uh, yeah. during the pandemic. Okay, and first question, Siguro, we can, um, Let's ask about yourself, Mona. Yeah. 
can you can you tell us about your origin, sir? Yung uh, about your family, like where you grew up as a young boy, and uh, you know, uh, sino yung naging sino yung parents niyo, and yeah, maybe friends or other girlfriends, yeah, stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, salamat uh, Arvin, salamat uh, Wildlife Biodiversity Conservation Society of the Philippines. Uh, mayong hapon sa inyong lahat. Uh, I'll just talk about my origins, uh, my parents and my brothers and sisters lived uh, near... Uh, pristine tropical environments, having rainforests and unpolluted seas in a small village in the town of Kawayan in southwestern Negros. During World War II, uh, that is uh, from 1941 to 1945, we lived uh, near this environment. And during this time, I got acquainted with all the biodiversity in the area, such as the birds, the bats, the lizards, and the beautiful coral reef in our village. Our family depended so much from agricultural products from our small farm and where we got fish and other marine species from our fish pond and our coral reef and my parents also owned a small area with uh, coconuts which uh, we periodically harvested for to maintain cash because my parents were were not employed they were all unemployed. And with 10 children at the time, I was the oldest, it was a difficult time for us. Uh, during the war, uh, 1941 to 1945, my job was to take care of our animals in the farm and did the little, did some real activities in uh, agriculture. And I also grew rice, learned to grow rice and vegetables for our consumption. And uh, of course, despite this poverty, I thank my parents for having a good job in supporting my basic needs in acquiring basic education and graduate education. At this stage, I would like to acknowledge my wife, Naomi, for being there to take care of our kids while I was out of the country for a period of three years, 1959 to 1960, and 1964 to 1966 in the USA at Stanford University. She made a good job of helping provide for the needs of the children while I was absent from the family. And also acknowledge the invaluable help of my brothers and sisters, my, particularly my two brothers, Keson and Loton, mm. who helped me in my fieldwork. I thank my other relatives for helping support our family in various ways, particularly my sister Julieta and her husband Chodolo, as well as my youngest son, uh, Eli, who served as assistants and co-authors of some of the papers that I wrote. Well, when I was young, you ask me what my dreams were, I will answer you one thing. I wanted to become a doctor, MD. Mm -hmm. 
but realized that my parents could not really afford it. Yes. So I up opted to study instead. Uh, I took a BS in biology degree in the in the Siliman University. Now, my academic beginnings. So schools that I attended. I attended primary schools in our barrio or village uh, and took an elementary school certificate. When I was, rather when in 1941, when war broke out in the country, I was in the elementary school in Kawayan, which is 14 kilometers from our village. And I had, I had to stay in the town away from my parents in order to study for the elementary school. But then, when uh, war broke out in 1941, that's the end of my elementary. I was still, I was grade six at the time, and that uh, that was uh, that was the time when I became a boy farmer in our farm and uh, so in uh, later years i applied uh, for high school in the uh, kubangkalan kubangkalan academy was that's a very near town about 40 kilometers away where there is a high school mm -hmm. and or high school then i at that time, I was uh, able to get a scholarship from a tuition scholarship because I was uh, I topped the uh, high school high school uh, class in 1948. So that was the reason why I was given a free tuition in uh, that uh, academy, high school academy. I, at that time, 1948. I applied for, I graduated in 1948, so I applied for entrance to Siliman University in Dumaguete. Again, Dumaguete is very far from our town, hundreds of kilometers away. And uh, it took me three years to study for this degree because I was in a hurry. See, uh, after high school, it took me just three years to finish the degree, the Bachelor of Science. Uh, and uh, after graduation, I went to Mindanao for one semester. Then I was called to Siliman by my professors in Siliman, Professor D.S. Rabor at the time. Yeah. He offered me a teaching job in Siliman. So I got, I took it and I, I uh, went through the ranks from instructor in 1951 and uh, 1951 up to 1952, I went back. And in 1935 years later, I retired from uh, from Silliman. While then at Silliman in 1954, I worked with uh, Walter Brown. Uh, who was then a professor in in uh, biology? His uh, work at uh, Stanford University as a uh, professor and uh, uh, doing and was doing systematic work for amphibians and reptiles. And he came to Suleiman on a full right grant, and he and I collaborated together. <coughs> How old were you then uh, when you when you met uh, Professor Walter Brown? Yeah, nineteen. We worked together, mm -hmm. and he he was responsible for my doing for for my uh, do uh, work at uh, at Stanford University, both at the masters uh, and the doctoral levels. Uh, 
You in college at Seliman, what was my thesis? No, we didn't have any thesis at all. In college? In college, we didn't have a thesis. Uh, bachelor of thesis, none. Oh, that's great. <laughs> you know, at that time, uh, we just, we just uh, took the courses. And I was so in a hurry, I finished it in three years. Oh I was God. too old already at the time. So, my master's thesis uh, dealt with breeding behavior on early development of frogs of negros. Mm -hmm. 11, 11 species of frogs out of the 15 at that time. Uh, I, I handled 11. And after I finished that, I gave it to Kupia. It was published in full. <laughs> uh, so I was very happy uh, for that event. and. Actually, my trip to the U.S. at the time was funded by the Fulbright Grant. I was happy to have that grant. How about my PhD thesis? My PhD thesis, my PhD thesis uh, dealt with three tropical lizards on Negros Island. Uh, the reason for this is that I found the I found uh, three questions, three, three species, two of them very stable with stable populations from year to year, except for one. Okay, and then, uh, so are there some questions at the time? To the uh, master's and PhD thesis? Mm -hmm. and, Sorry, and, the, uh, the, and the thesis dealt with three lizards. Uh -huh. I took several years, three, three to four, no, three to five years. Marking those lizards. Mm -hmm. So you're, oh, you were doing you were doing mark and recapture study. Mark and recapture yeah. techniques. Okay. Okay. Any question? Huh? So, sorry. How 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 is it like during that time? You, you, this is like 1950s. What's the environment like? At least in in your in your area in Dumaguete. Uh, what's the the forests like during yeah, that time quiet life quiet life in umagete and very uh umagete is a peaceful uh, town mm -hmm. we, we almost at the almost everybody knew everybody at the time when i was a student and there were of course uh, no vehicles except horse drawn carriages the tartanilia they call it <laughs> drawn by horses so it was a sleepy town. But this university, of course, Seliman is steeped in the tradition of research. That's why I went there. So, so how do you how was doing field work like during that day during those days? Um, yeah, do you, I mean, do you during just those walk, days, yeah? During those days, uh, it was during those days it was the communities where we went to for field work, the mountain areas, because we did mountain areas, yes. mostly first uh, Mount Baco or Mount Halcon, part of Mount Halcon Range in uh, Mindoro was my first uh, field work. And uh, Mount Canlaon second. And uh, uh, people were nice at the time. It was easy to get permits. There were no th threats for uh, people that will do you harm in the field. And even people in the field were very nice. And it was a pleasure to do work. But in order to go there, we have to port our things, all our belongings, both yes. in Mount Canlon and in Mount Halcon. So we could just imagine that uh, during those years, the the forest, the the lasang is quite extensive still. The Gantai. Well, I'll forest. describe to you the tropical rainforest as three stories: the tallest stories, the middle stories, and the lowest stories. The three layers, three storied forest, tropical rainforest, and on the ground you have plenty of humus and dry decaying lugs. Mm -hmm. And all of the trees are epiphytes, and these are all habitats of lizards. And this 
these are the habitats that were not explored by earlier uh, field workers in the country. They were not. So we did it. That's why we did so many new. We found out many new things in yeah. this forest. Okay. So you, you well, you by our last count, you and Dr. Brown, uh, Walter Brown, and others were able to describe at least 55 species of frogs and lizards for the Philippines. That's right. And snakes. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and the snakes. Yeah. We, we collected some snakes, but we passed it on to Al Leviton. Yeah. And he described them. And one of these snakes was a new species named mm -hmm. after me. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lycodon alkali or Ophistotropis alkali? Ophistotropis alkali. alkali. <laughs> so, sir, um, uh, you're 91 years old, and Diva, you were born on March 1st, 1929. 1929. So you're 91 and still going strong. Still 91. Almost 92. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm ready to surrender. <laughs> surrender to no. him. A biologist to carry on my work, <laughs> and there is Abner waiting yeah. in the wings. <laughs> you, you can, yeah, you can, you can still uh, influence a lot of people, Papa. So, so uh, you, basically, you were the first, you were the first Filipino herpetologist. That's right. In fact, when I checked the records at the time, all the works on herpetology were done by foreigners, yeah. by foreign scientists. From yes. Europe, from mostly from the U.S. at the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I said, "Makaulaw ito, makahiya ito." We are Filipinos. We are not interested in our own biodiversity. So I, I really decided to become a herpetologist mm -hmm. because I knew that that was there were plenty of challenges for me in this field. So when you. When when you decided to become a biologist, a field biologist, a naturalist, uh, um, anong anong sabi ng parents niya, sir? What, what did your parents tell you? Well, uh, remember I said I, I wanted to become an MD. Yeah. But I I apologize to them for not having enough finances for that to pursue that degree. Mm -hmm. So my parents were really satisfied that I should find a job with a degree, with a Bachelor of Science degree. It was not so until after my one semester vacation in Mindanao, in a second semester of uh, 19, uh, the time, uh, 19... Uh, 50, 51. It was in 1952 that I became a faculty member of Suleiman on the invitation of my professor aboard. 1952. You were 20, 21 or 22 years old. Right? 20, 22. Yeah. So, when I was 20, 23 or 24 and 24, I did do, I, I was part of the Rabor group that visited mountain mountain ranges, first yeah. in Luzon and uh, uh, Mount Halcon, and next in Mount Canlaon on Negros Island. Yeah. But the, uh, see, I was, I was collecting amphibians during my spare time at that time because Professor Rabor wanted us to work on birds and mammals. Yeah. He was shooting all those birds and mammals and skinning them off. And we used to eat the flesh, by the way. <laughs> you skin the birds, you don't throw away the flesh, you eat them. <laughs> yeah. And that's what we did. But at night, I operated as a herpetologist. Look at the frogs. Uh, in both areas in uh, Mindoro and in Mount Canlaon. That's the subject of our first paper in 1955. So, uh, um, sir, so basically you 
taught yourself, nag self teach kayo on herpetology, I guess, by reading right. uh, papers and books by yeah, Edward sure. Taylor and. Yeah. You're right. Self teaching. I, I self taught myself before before Rob, uh, before uh, Walter Brown came to the to the uh, university. I began really on my own. On the, as a naturalist at that time. That's fascinating uh, story. Uh, <laughs> sir, sir, yung during that time, uh, she, Professor uh, Rabor was uh, the, 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 he, he was he was much older. Prof right? for uh, professor. Yeah. So, so yeah, and he, he was, and was he, he, had, he had finished his MS. Okay, pero he's also from the Central Philippines. I guess he was from Cebu, right? Or he's from Cebu. I, yes, yeah. originally from Cebu. But he finished his masters in the UP. Mm -hmm. There he is, <laughs> and Chapman was the one really, the right there. Chapman began the research. Uh, a program of uh, the university at Siliman. And that's what attracted me to go to Siliman because mm. it was known for research in natural history. And then at the time I went there, Rabor was there to help me. So apart from Professor Walter Brown, who is shown here in this photo, who are your um, major or primary collaborators during that time? So we can see My here, uh, well, yeah, Walter Brown and uh, other people. Uh, well, yeah, we, we were the, well, we we did some work together with the pro, with my two professor friends in the biology department, Professor mm -hmm. A. Y. Reyes and Professor Rodolfo Gonzalez. Both mm -hmm. of them are dead now, and they both three of us helped together. Pursue and pursuing herpetological work. And I co authored with them several papers. Yeah, so, yeah shown here. Uh, sir, if you can see the screen, these are shots, uh, photos of uh, images of you doing field work and other of your collaborators. Uh, yeah, and these are all uh, photographed in. And uh, Cuernos de Negros of Talinis. <coughs> we photographed at the time, we were camped at about 3,000 feet above sea level. And we had to hide <coughs> going up that mountain, which was still in pristine condition. All the forest was pristine. That's why I like it. I like the field work. So, sir, during that time, uh, was there already forest uh, destruction? like um, deforestation, uh, logging, especially, or you know, mechanized logging uh, during those years, or? Yeah, in other places, not in the Negros Oriental side where we worked. Kalinis was uh, almost uh, pristine. No, no, nobody touched the forest trees there. So we work under good forest conditions at the time. Mm -hmm. It could have been a very different world back then. Uh, lalo na na marami pang forests and primary forests and old growth. Uh, you you so, are right. Yeah. Now, so, there is ritual to despair. <laughs> yeah, we will be, actually, we will be talking about that uh, later on uh, towards the end of the, the conversation. Yeah, yeah, sure. But uh, for now, uh, sir, you, you, well, you were a terrestrial biologist, especially herpetology, and who, yes. uh, who really inspired you to become one, to become a herpetologist? So you said Walter, si Walter and Brown lang po ba? Or Walter other Brown. people? Walter Brown talaga. He was, he was, a, he was a professional eco uh, ecologist taxonomist. And he and I agreed that we will, I will do mostly the ecology and he will do the taxonomy. In mm -hmm. both cases, we collaborated together. 
Yeah, so that's a perfect compliment. So, so how did you, because I'm aware that you you and Professor, Br Professor Brown became a lifetime collaborator. So how, how was your relationship back then? Was it, you know, quite... You um, know, uh, he, he, when he came to the Philippines twice, or three times, he came to the Philippines three times at Suleiman and uh, work with me here yeah after the first up uh, after he he came here in 1954 1955 he he uh, you know he went back to the u.s after that and uh applied to the national science foundation for some grants to fund our projects hmm. and so yep. he came back twice later and work with us here. Mm -hmm. So I was really, he became really a professional <laughs> herpetologist with Walter Brown as uh, my mentor. Mm -hmm. And during this time, you already had your family or you, you've met uh, Mom Naomi, your wife or? Yeah, I, I, I have met my wife at that time. 19, we were married in 1952. Okay. Well, where did you where did you meet Kayoni Mam Naomi? We're neighbors in uh <laughs> Oyam, just a few kilometers away. Uh huh. Ah, kami lang dalawa. We were and uh, I must say that she was one of the prettiest ladies <laughs> at the time in our area. <laughs> Sir, ano rin man, pa pareho man kayo. Maaya rin, maaya. Uh, meron kayo, Sir, uh, I'm going to be very cheesy. Eh. Meron kayong love song? Mar Maroon what? Mer Naaka yung love song ni Ma'am Naomi? Oh, I see. <laughs> right. You know, uh, my friend, Procesio Darbe, Reverend mm -hmm. Darbe, wrote a song for us. Oh, really? Yeah. That's yeah, interesting. It's, uh, it's published in the, it's published in the Silliman Journal, I believe. But uh, we uh, learned that and the, some of that during the web, uh, our uh, uh, celebration a uh, little later. Oh wow, that's that's really it's fascinating. Uh, uh, yung song po is uh, in uh, Cebuana language or in, or is it in English? Well, which language yung song niya? Do you uh, English. <laughs> uh, okay, can you do you remember any of the lines? Say I will. We will ask you to sing a few lines. Sana. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't remember that anymore. Uh, okay. I can I can look for it in this one week. <clears throat> uh, I'll uh, send you. Uh, yeah, Siguro we will have a session. Uh, uh, National scientist Angel Alcala singing a song for us. So, na lang. <laughs> I mean, well, later we can do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, by the way, I should tell you, when I was grade five, I flunked music. My teacher was a good musician, but I was so shy that he flunked me with seven, a grade of 70 in my card. I, <laughs> I got so bad about it. Luckily, my teacher, who was uh, from Ilocos uh, province, mm -hmm. one of the Ilocos right. provinces, changed the grade to 80, 70 to 80. So I passed just the same. But that oh, music wow. teacher really flunked me because I didn't like to sing. <laughs> ah. Okay. So that is one of the things I did. <laughs> so you... um. Okay, what else can I ask you? So you're, because I remember, sir, when, when we met, I think you were, I think this was like five, six or seven years ago. And you mentioned yeah. that you were taking care. Uh, I, I'm, I might be wrong, it's a, it's a number of years. And you said you were taking care mm -hmm. of your mother. And actually we yes. were, yeah, we were so, you know, uh, astonished now. Wow, your mother was still around back then. So, 
Nine. My mother was and, a wonderful woman. She lived up to 102 years of age. Wow. But the last, last year, she was just sleeping all the time. But she worked very hard. And she was a brave soul. Your father, Po, uh, how old was he? Do you remember when, when he passed? I think 88. I think I think 88 when he died. But my father was a, a high school teacher. He fi finished high school and taught for a while in uh, one of the private schools in Southern Negros. But, but after that, he was uh, out of work. And mm -hmm. uh, he and my mother settled in uh, Aliling Negros, Kawayan Negros Occidental. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, actually, yung, yung story niya po, uh, growing up is you know, uh, very, you know, it's a typical Filipino, yung mga, um, yung mga olden days na, na story po, uh, from, uh, you know, showing that yeah, if yeah. you really work hard, you can reach your goals, eh, your dreams in life. Eh, so. And that's, that's very that's right. Yeah. I really work hard. That's a typical story. And, and uh, hopefully, um, our listeners, especially the younger generation, uh, you can learn uh, uh, a lot of lesson from this. Uh, uh, especially now, uh, especially some of the youth. Now uh, you really, you know, value your youth, your life, and you know just reach for your goals your dreams okay so uh so we've gi you've given us some background about yourself and your beginnings and apart from being uh, a her an, a terrestrial biologist and herpetologist uh we know and actually the, the world knows that you are also a marine biologist do tell us about your journey uh, uh, to, to, yes, to become as a marine biologist. Yeah, as a marine biologist. How you how you started and well, it started uh, really long before uh, during the war days. The, the the idea was implanted on my mind during the war years when we were in the in Kaliling because we we saw an I saw and appreciated. The marine environment, especially the coral reefs, were beautiful, beautiful coral reefs in our area, near our home at that time. Yeah. And we used to go there and admire the fish and the many fish and the corals with all colors. That had a blasting effect on my mind. So even though I became a herpetologist, I did not forget such experience in early life. So when I went back to the USA after my master's see, and work on my PA, we worked my PA, my doctorate at Stanford. I was surrounded by many friends who were, who were specialists on fish. We were together, we had good discussions of fish and other marine organisms and my interest was brought out again. And so that the, I, after I finished my degree, PhD, in 1966, it took only, well, it's certain about four or five years, actually four years, before I became, I, I immersed myself in another field of study, namely marine biology. Yeah. And at that time, I thought that our coral reefs, were an important ecosystem in the country where you can see all kinds of organisms and all kinds of fish and all those beautiful beautiful ecosystem and i was so struck by how the coral reefs function and i was wondering why 
Some reefs did not produce much fish. I look at the environment and I saw that the coral the corals were removed or destroyed by by fishermen. The fishermen themselves destroyed the corals and got only the fish. So many of these coral reefs were destroyed by fishermen by fishing methods. So mm -hmm. I resort to do work on coral reefs. When I began in the early 1970s to work on Somelon Island, my work at the time was funded by the National Research Council of the Philippines. And it took me, it took me a decade to continue that work. And I showed with that first paper <clears throat> that I published on Somelon. And that if corals, coral reef is preserved <clears throat> and protected, it will pre it will accumulate fish biomass of up to 120 tons per square kilometer protected. And this biomass of fish will move out of the marine protected area and and go to areas fished by people. And so there is an element of sustainability of those coral reefs when fish keep coming back, keep coming to it to settle coming from the marine reserve. So I thought in my mind that I must protect these coral reefs with the help of communities. And I began working on communities to encourage them, to empower them to develop a healthy attitude towards coral reef, avoid using destroying the coral, but protect them. And community work was done by these people in Apu Island, mm -hmm. and I showed that that reef continued to increase in fish biomass because of this fish that got out of the marine protected area to go to the fishing areas. Because what I did was to protect an area here and leave the other areas fishing grounds. So the fish move out from the protected area to areas that are not protected from fishing. But with the condition that these fishermen must not, must use only fishing methods that do not destroy the corals. The corals must be at the 60 or 70 percent cover, real life cover, in order to have more fish to develop. And I go back to the to the concept of the earlier ecologists that the environment, be it tropical rainforest or coral reef, determines very much how productive it, it will be if it is protected. So protection is necessary in preserving our fishery resources. That's what I learned. Not only fisheries, but also other host of marine organisms, which during my time I started publishing on them, including uh, what we call the starfish that destroys corals. I hated them. I hated them because they eat corals. So I removed them from my uh, study area in Sumilon and published on that. And that took uh, many people in, to surprise. They were surprised that I reported large biomass in these protected areas. And that began the work on marine protected concept in mm -hmm. the country. So, so you're... At the time. But yeah. the, the origin actually take, it took back to the earlier days, uh, 1941 to 1945, when I was in Kaliling. So that's the, that's your growth of knowledge on the marine environment too, uh, sir. We'll be talking more about this uh, this topic uh, for the next segment, and uh, definitely yeah. we'll be asking more questions. And then later on, uh, towards the, the the last part of the the next segment, we will be inviting some people. So we will go for a short break, Muna, uh, sure. so that we can yeah we can um, yeah. Yeah, we can have um, uh, some 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 um some rest muna uh, especially kesar 
and we'll be back in a few minutes. So again, uh, if you have questions for uh, our special guest, National Scientist Alcala, uh, key in your uh, questions to send your questions to the chat box. And then our uh, facilitators will be um, sending, sending the questions to, to us later on. And we'll be reading them actually uh, towards the end of the, uh, the talk show. So for now, uh, let's go for a break. Uh, so, sorry, hindi ko pala napakilala yung sarili ko. My name is Arvin Diasmas. I'm actually one of uh, the students of um, National Scientist Alcala. Uh, um, and I am um, I am uh, with the National oh, Museum. Colleague. Yes. Not my sure. but my colleague right now. Yeah. <laughs> Arvin Diasmas. A colleague, wow. Uh, from, uh, from, uh, from him. It's uh, such an honor, sir. And um, I'm with the National Museum of the Philippines, but I'm also a member of the WCSP. And I'm affiliated also with the National Research Council of the Philippines, National Academy of Science and Technology, uh, Herp Watch Filipinas, uh, uh, Center for Conservation Innovations, and um, Crocodile Sporosis Philippines Incorporated, and the University of Santa Tomas yeah. in Manila. Uh, University of the Philippines and the La, the La Salle University. So we'll go for a short break and then we'll be back in a few minutes. Don't go away. <clears throat> Sir, break time, Taya. Uh,
<laughs> okay, we're back. And again, we're with uh, National Scientist Angel Alcala. And uh, we are uh, having this conversation and it's all about him. It's all about uh, National Scientist Alcala. So um, from our last conversation, Pastor, we, uh, we, what we've left off, I, um, you mentioned that um, you basically started doing marine work during the 70s, right? And then you, and then you established um, the marine lab in 1974. Is, is that correct, sir? Yeah. So, so can you, again, uh, what sorts of, what sorts of, um, uh, other research did you do? And of course, your pioneering work was in Sumilon. And basically, that was when the concept of marine protected areas essentially began you know, for the country. So, yeah. Can you share again more, more knowledge about this, this marine work of yours in the central Philippines? Maybe starting with marine, yeah, yeah marine lab of Siliman. Well, the marine lab. But the marine lab, we promoted, promoted other studies. One of them is the uh, crocodile breeding. or the, the first breeding program for crocodilus mindrensis was made at the marine laboratory. Mm -hmm. 200 uh, individuals were produced, more than 200 individuals were produced in the laboratory. And they were all uh, exported out um, or to other interested individuals to, and also to uh, people abroad. Uh, aside from the crocodilus process, which we did in the late, late 80s, we did also the giant clam. Giant mm -hmm. clam uh, of... Uh, the Philippines, there are nine species, and we did giant clam breeding. And the results of this breeding, the young ones were sent back, were, were uh, distributed to marine protected areas or other coral reefs around the country. And in our in instance, uh, we have uh, giant clams in the, uh, some islands. Uh, yeah, in uh, near uh, near Mindanao, so that uh, those two were, uh, were done uh, by us to conserve the giant clam. And well, the, aside from that, we have advocacy programs uh, like. Uh, 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 efforts at uh, reducing the deforestation of the the Lake Danao, Lake uh, Balintasayo area. We're uh, asking people to stop or de denuding that area. And so we are successful until now that we have preserved, we really have preserved that lake as a park. <clears throat> now, uh, my other colleagues there at the Marine Lab did some other work, but the main work that uh, lab is the marine protected area uh, program, um, which which we really pioneered, and uh, uh, in uh, collaboration with the late natural scientist, national scientist Ed Gomez, of the we together. Uh, work on uh, giant clams and uh, so the marine lab did other work as well including some thesis for students and of course national scientist ed gomez is from the university of the philippines uh, the marine science university of philippines yeah so sir the uh, Siliman Marine Lab, the Marine Lab in Siliman was established in 1974, po, ano? and uh, was yes. UPMSI 
already i'm not aware i'm sorry uh, to to the viewers uh who, who was first to, to be established yung up marine or yung siliman marine lab pa the, the, the marine okay. lab of the up was established later sir. okay and you Not the first you helped uh, your your good friend the late uh, national scientist rampana yeah, was, was my close friend and uh, we got we, we got finally in the 1990s a grant from USAID which we built we used to build that laboratory so we have mm -hmm. a two story building right now and we are, we are building more uh, rooms adjacent to that building to house uh, library or library and mm -hmm. so on yeah so the the that's the Siliman University Angelo King Center for Research and Management, which was established yeah. in 2004, right? 2004, for sure. 2009. 2009, okay. And so, um, 1999. Okay. 1999. 1999, sorry. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so at the part, let's, let's move deeper in, in uh, discussing about uh, science and society. Eh? And you've mentioned earlier, Pona, uh, you've learned a lot uh, and your, the, the results of your research you know, help uh, the people, the community in, in your area, uh, especially in Sumilan and uh, nearby islands now. So ca can you tell us more about uh, the, the, the results of your work there? You know, and who who are your collaborators also during uh, during this work in the marine um, in marine biology and marine conservation? Hmm. Well, uh, marine work first began with uh, our own stuff at the marine laboratory, but we since we were doing community work in the islands. Uh, we sort of uh, influenced so many many communities in small islands of of uh, Mindanao, northern Mindanao. There are many small islands there where we set up marine protected areas, and we empowered mm -hmm. the local communities to do the management and protection of the reefs, telling them mm -hmm. that if they do that, they, they will have peace all the time. So, so that's how you the, convinced them? That's how you, that's you were able to convince them? That's how we see it. So the, the what we call uh, uh, protected areas concept is very important. Mm -hmm. Community-based conservation of coral reefs and marine conservation done by communities is the right thing to do. There are Apo is number one example of this. The uh, big coral reef in northern Negros Occidental uh, uh, established with the help of former congressman uh, uh, Mel, Mer congressman, uh, well, I forgot his name, but he was, he was my, uh, actually, he was he worked on uh, uh, marine protection by establishing protected areas, and he his, he he was governor of Negros Occidental after before his death, mm -hmm. recent death this month. Congressman Maranon, is uh, it Maranon? Ba? Maranon, Maranon, Maranon. Maranon, okay, Maranon. Congressman Maranon, Fre Freddy Maranon. Mm -hmm. He was my colleague. We were together and uh, going to coral reefs up to the Sulu Sea, to the Tubataha areas. We were there. Wow. We, we established those. We went up to the Sulu Sea. I mean, and I, he, he was one exceptional congressman that uh, I know. And he was not afraid to use his own money in order to protect his area. And he was the guiding uh, spirit for the establishment of the largest marine protected area in the Visayan Sea. And that is still one of the best protected areas in the country today. 
where we introduced all kinds of species, including the giant flowers. So that was my partner, a, a, a certain politician like that. He was an exceptional guy. And that, that's what I like, because there are other politicians that uh, are, are, are not as good as him. They were just, they're just talk. And not only that, they violate rules of protected areas. <laughs> I have I had a quarrel with the congressman of Cebu because he raided the marine protected area of Sumilon. See, when the protected area was progressing very well. But that, uh, and one time we had a, a discussion in the Senate and I, he was just beside me and I was lambasting him the senate for not uh, for doing bad things about uh, coral reefs which were set up in his own in his own town in southern cebu on the island of sumilon mm -hmm. see so so we so many islands where we had community community based conservation and i think that is the strategy for conserving protected areas yeah. And that is going on now by networking all these marine, these marine reserves all over the country. And now the UP has also has also done some work along this line, and uh, they are also protecting coral reefs, following our example. And this time, we are the leaders, and they are the followers. <laughs> so um but that's why uh, so, uh, when you, when you, <laughs> so you 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 had to work with the community especially the fishermen yes and i, I yeah and i'm yes. sure uh um, that was uh, also a challenge but uh which is uh which is more difficult working with the community the local people or working with the politicians well, uh, work, difficult with working with politicians because they they will say yes, I will do it, but they don't do they don't do the thing at all. Mm -hmm. So they are many politicians are words only. See, except for uh, Congressman Moranion, who was true to uh, us as a conservationist, a truly good conservationist, and that is what I have learned. So, sir, uh, tell us more about the um, learnings ninyo, the mga lessons in doing science and then applying this knowledge to help uh, local communities and, of course, marine resources and biodiversity. So, girl, uh, at this point, sir, we will call uh, two of your colleagues. Uh, we will call them. Uh, I said, uh, uh, they will join us in, in this conversation because they're also, um, you, you've uh, collaborated with them also. So uh, friends, uh, let's call on see Mr. Abner Bukol. Yeah. And see Rainier Manalo. And uh, uh, we are joined by them to, to, uh, to have more of this conversation about uh, science and society and you know, applying the the scientific facts and the results. Yeah. So Doctor go ahead. Good afternoon, Dr. Alcala. Good afternoon, Dr. Arvin. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Good afternoon sir. Hi. So, so Segura, sir, see, uh, let's start with um, Abner Muna. And do tell us about your uh, collaboration with, with Sir Alcala and you know and the work uh, being done at uh, the marine lab at Siliman mm, Abner Hello uh, can you, yeah can you can you hear me yes. uh, tell us about, yeah, Good afternoon yeah, everyone in, uh, especially yeah. to Dr Alcala Well, uh, I started working with Dr. Alcala way back in 2008. 
and at, at first as a as a volunteer for one month and he kind of observed me if he can deliver <laughs> and I, I think I, I passed his <laughs> some of his basic expectations and so he trained me through uh, field work, mostly by field work and uh, actual, actual work, uh, not just on theories, uh, but uh, actual going to the field. And uh, at that moment, uh, my very first encounter with him, I immediately recognized that what I learned from college days were so minute compared to that of the real world, the vastness, the depth of Dr. Alcala's knowledge, and also to visit the Marine Lab back then as a student from State University. I was surprised that one of his uh, assistants, I met the uh, uh, Mr. Zacharias Hineroso, and he was, uh, uh, was already in his, you know, uh, maybe 80s, almost 80s or 70s. And I thought he was Dr. Alcala. <laughs> it's very funny because <laughs> I immediately assumed that he was Dr. Alcala because he has, and at, at that time I never met Dr. Alcala in person. I only read him through textbooks in high school and and when I visited the marine lab, there was this guy taking care of the aquarium at the marine lab, uh, explaining to stu student visitors and everybody about coral reefs, uh, giant clams, with the details, knowledge. So I immediately assumed it was him. So I immediately asked the guy, are you Dr. Alcala? <laughs> and he, he said, no, I'm just his assistant. <laughs> I come a fixed biology graduate without knowledge of these things <laughs> compared to an assistant. So at that moment, I made my decision to finally meet uh, Dr. Alcala, but he was always uh, out of town and so it took a while for me to meet him and present my my intention to work with him. And luckily during that time, uh, I already had my very first paper on birds, on the endangered species of bird in Sikihor. And I immediately, once it was published at uh, Silliman Journal, uh, initially it was a trashy paper, uh, but with the help of the reviewers, <laughs> it uh, finally came into the uh, good form. And uh, Dr. Alcala said, well, you finished a degree and you have this uh, one very short paper uh, you need to learn more for me. <laughs> and so it started uh, that way. And initially I thought I would be assigned entirely on terrestrial biology, but my very first assignment turned out to be on marine reserve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it was my first project with him to assess the status of the marine reserves in the entire Visayas. There were more than 560 of them at that time in 2008. And we were surprised that only about one third of the established TPAs in the whole Visayas were functional, mm -hmm. according to Dr. Alcala's standard, of course. And the standard during that time, uh, way back in 2008, it was based entirely on management status. Uh, if a marine reserve has an ordinance, there's a management body, 
uh, most ill Jews consider them as functional. But with Dr. Alcala's set of criteria, we reassess them. But it was kind of more stringent because it could involve assessment whether or not the employee has good coral cover, good uh, mangrove coverage, and high fish biomass. And mm -hmm. I think for the first one, most of these MPAs failed the expectations. And subsequent studies later on confirmed that uh, roughly 30%, uh, around the figure, uh, in the entire Philippine archipelago, uh, only about 30% of them are actually functional. And mm -hmm. that, I think there's a serious need to reconsider uh, the management uh, situation of the whole uh, marine reserves in the entire Philippines. And there are more than 1,600 of them. So, so Abner, uh, l let me ask again. Uh, so there are more than 1,600 marine protected areas around the country. And you mentioned only 30% are in pretty good. Really, really working. Oh my gosh. Yes. Uh, how alarming even, is that? Uh, some are even can be considered uh, paper parks. <laughs> you know, they're just established with ordinance, but somehow uh, there's failure in the management. Uh, that's kind of alarming. Uh, to me. So, so, Sir Anung, yeah. uh, Sir Alcala, um, so young lessons uh, that you've uh, in terms of your, you know, uh, in your scientific work on marine, then how do we ensure uh, that the country is doing uh, an, uh, uh, work on protect on keeping these marine protected areas well protected? And how do we how do we go about doing that then? That is where uh, we, uh, we recognize uh, challenges because behaviorally, people responsible for marine protected areas and marine reserves uh, have, the, have various types of behavior patterns. Uh, only about one fourth of them are really sold to the idea. That's why the work on uh, social work on, on um, managers uh, of marine protected areas should continue. Otherwise, we cannot cover the whole archipelago with protected areas. We estimate that it takes a long time for all these uh, areas to have protected areas as well because of the behavior patterns of many of our people. Behavioral is behavioral questions are very important for uh, those working at marine research mm -hmm. because so, that is the behavior of some of our people. So this That's is where we need more attention to the communities, to the yeah. local government units, and the gov local government units uh, are not so successful in in convincing their people to do protected areas. So there, well, there are some outstanding examples of fully protected marine reserves. There are many that are not. So there is still uh, a lot of things to do in marine protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's quite worrying. So in short, uh, not only Science is science should be uh, science is just one factor in really uh, seeing yeah. the success of, of this uh, protected protected areas now. So maraming additional factors, you know, social science and and so forth. So social pero, scientists are needed too. Yeah, yeah. And so, also political will of the uh, local. Chief executives, I think. 
But that's sir, why, sir, in, in this country, this country polit politics, politics rule almost every action of local governments. So, yeah. you know. Sir, so um, if you um, if you you have if you have uh, if you can show us or if, if you can give a, a a big a larger picture, no, about the mm -hmm. status of marine protected area system in the Philippines. So, which ones are doing better? Uh, which part of the the country? I, I'm sure you know. Several, there are several in the central Philippines and especially in the Visayas, Visayan region yeah, yeah. around the Negros that are doing yeah, well. Doing. Negros Occidental, there are some more. Mm -hmm. That's behavioral pattern of what people that maintain good marine protected areas. Mm -hmm. it's, it's surprising because these are the people that that would require the marine environment to produce food for them. Yet they are not doing their jobs. Most of them don't do their jobs well. That's a problem that should be continued. So more focused, we have more focus on the community to do it. Not the not the national government itself by itself. It should be community based. Mm -hmm. But definitely, the national government can can really help. No, uh, for example, with the help of uh, LGUs and the departments as well. Definitely, but no. they they could play a major role. Then, no. So, um, so apart from your work, some marine, uh, 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 we have here Rainier Manalo. Uh, of course, you know him. Uh, people know him as um, a crocodile biologist. No, and uh, he's, he's, he's been doing for many years now uh, a lot of work in research and conservation works at uh, crocodiles. And see si Angel Alcala, again, uh, I'm sure no one will be surprised, is the first uh, Filipino Ren who did work on crocodiles. So, so sir, Aka, can you, you, know, can you uh, tell us some stories about your initial work on crocodiles and then uh, para makapag-join ng conversation rin si Rainier with us about crocodiles. Rainier? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, uh, Doc Arvs, uh, Arvin, you're right. Uh, Dr. Alcala is the first uh, herpetologist and also the first Filipino working on in crocodiles. Uh, when mm -hmm. I joined uh, Crocodile Farming Institute in 19... 1918 and 1998. Uh, I, read, uh, I read uh, the name Dr. Alcala and I searched on it and uh, I'm amazed that uh, there is a Philippine crocodile in Marine Lab uh, with the collaboration uh, on the works of uh, Andy Ross, a Smithsonian herpetologist, then and working with uh, Dr. Alcala. In, in the distribution of Philippine crocodiles in the Philippines, uh, it came uh, my to my attention. Uh, there is a lot of uh, the need to to do about the uh, Philippine crocodile and uh, also for the behavior and the uh, distribution of it. And I start working on it um, until now. Uh, we work with uh, Dr. Alcala, and I, we first uh, have collaborated with Dr. Alcala's work during my my time in uh, the Crocodilus Process Philippines Incorporated with a project in Shargao, Shargao Island. And, uh, I understand that uh, the site in Shargao was just, uh, explored first by Dr. Alcala and uh, Andy Ross. And then we came after them to, to finish the work that we have started. And uh, ito na, uh, we're doing more on the crocodiles and Philippine crocodiles. And we are still uh, supporting the marine lab uh, for the uh, enhancement of conservation breeding in, in, in their, uh, uh, in, uh, under the guidance of Dr. Alcala. Yeah. So, so gentlemen, t tell us, because um, uh, like last week, the internet and the news, the media was abuzz on fire with 
this huge uh, crocodile that was caught recently diba right? sa Tawi-Tawi area sa Simunol yes. and of course uh, many years ago uh, the you know the giant crocodile lolong uh, basically mm-hmm. captured the attention of you know Filipinos and many people around the world now mm-hmm. pero based on scientific research ba uh, what is the the, the importance, but the ecological importance of crocodiles in the ecosystem. So, yeah, I'm sure, uh, we, you know, did, we, did, we, we have a collaborative uh, work with uh, Suakrem, also Abner, and Dr. Alcala, and uh, the, the Crocodilus Process Philippines Incorporated. We, yeah, we, uh, what, we what do we call it? The hypothesis of pit cow. Uh, then uh, Abno, which we try to determine if that hypothesis is the true one, when uh, increasing the uh, fish productivity or aquatic productivity of these waters with uh, crocodiles. I think Abner can can insert some of the uh, findings that we had. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we have we have that paper. Uh, it was just approved recently, and hopefully it will be coming out soon. <laughs> About uh, we we tried to to revisit the hypothesis by uh, the German scientist P. J. Fitkow in 1971, but that was based on his observations, uh, including uh, observations also of the locals in the Amazon of the fact that when the caimans, the crocodilians there, were removed or hunted to near extinction, the fishery also collapsed. And the hypothesis was that crocodiles play a major role in enhancing the nutrient uh, regime of the aquatic bodies. But when we tried to apply or design some similar studies in the Philippines, so one of the sites is in Chargao, another is in Palawan. So there are actually some confounding factors uh, such that we cannot just attribute the fishery enhancement effect to the presence of crocodilians. And I think the reviewers also pointed out that uh, we should be very, very careful when we assume uh, such role of the crocodilians in terms of uh, fishery enhancement. Because, for example, in Shargao, um, we in just one year mm-hmm. of introducing the uh, Crocodilus mendorensis there, we noticed an immediate increase in fish catch, which is a good thing, but we cannot attribute it 100% to the, just the mere, mere presence of the crocodiles simply because they also, the community also banned the fishing. So, and, and we know that when you reduce fishing uh, activities or fishing pressure, naturally the fish stocks would also recover. While in Palawan, uh, we also noticed that in areas where there are crocodiles, for example, in Rio Tuba, ang lalaki ng mga ista and the fish catch is so, uh, is noticeable, noticeably higher compared to areas where there are no crocodiles. And Again, there, there might be some effect on the, the effects of the, the, the crocodile metabolic wastes. Mm-hmm. But yeah. we also noticed that, again, fishing pressure was also lower in areas where there are crocodiles, simply because the locals are kind of cautious and afraid to intensify their fishing effort in those areas. Plus the fact that there's also an increased uh, number of households in those, are- in those areas, you know, 
for example in Rio Tuba ang daming mga bahay-bahay sa paligid and that is uh, one potential okay, source of okay. so yung iba wala namang uh, proper toilets yeah. uh, of course there waste including waste from livestock ay eh, napupunta rin sa aquatic uh, environment so yes there might be some effect but it's very hard to demonstrate here in the philippines simply because of some confounding factors yeah, well, the admir, so try to determine these confounding factors and improve in the, uh, put that into the equation. Uh, you might determine what are those confounding factors and then include, include that as uh, part of the study. But, 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 yeah. Yeah. If you yeah. can improve the discuss, so be it, even if it's only part. They can only explain a part of the fish production. Yeah. Okay. But the good thing here, sir, is uh, when we presented uh, this initial report in the uh, World Crocodilian Conference, others have been interested to revisit pit cow, and they made it in, in other regions. So after yeah. we did one, so it's the, for, uh, the second study that conducted this, and maybe three more countries has been conducting uh, to revisit this uh, pit cow theory. And nobody can justify now this uh, the common, commonly or pub publicized uh, hypothesis of pit cow that crocodiles can increase uh, nutrients through their fecal matters and increase in plankton, which uh, the fish can grow and provide food for humans when we have a larger fish that uh, eats the smaller fish through the, the production of uh, phytoplankton in the bodies of water. So it's a good thing that. Uh, we present the, this preliminary uh, results and the other countries are now investigating until now. Oh, okay. It's good to hear. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, now meron kayong, meron kayong bagong uh, thesis galing kay sir, huh? Yeah. So speaking of thesis, uh, uh, we're shifting into our last segment na. Uh, the next segment will be uh, the future. And uh, we will be, we will be talking more about mentoring and uh, students and um, and advice uh, from uh, Angel Alcala. No? Pero before we shift to the final segment, uh, let's go for another break, um, a few minutes break, uh, and then uh, we'll be back. Yeah, sure. All right. And
to our final segment, sir. Um, uh, final segment na po ito. Are you doing doing okay, sir? Yeah. Okay. Ah, sige, okay. we can uh, still very uh, lively and uh, stuff. Uh, so so uh, before we before we move on to the final segment, again, the, this segment will be about uh, your students you know, and mentoring and giving advice. And we will, lastly, we will ask you about uh, what mm -hmm. you think about um, the, the, the state of biodiversity in the country. Yeah. And pero, uh, after this, uh, I would like to, to remind the audience that uh, for your questions, we will be answering, uh, Dr. Alcala, National Scientist Alcala will be uh, answering them uh, right after the, this segment. So I will be reading out your uh, questions that have been chosen, and then we will be uh, throwing them out to to um, for Alcala, to, Dr. Alcala, to to answer. Okay, so the um, final segment natin ngayon is about. The subtitle is advice for the young and the young at heart. So um, the, the way the way the way this works, sir, is uh, we've invited a few of your a few students um, to tell us about their uh, experience with you. And then, uh, hindi naman lahat, kasi I'm sure marami yun. So, uh, we've only invited quite a few. And kasama na po ako doon. So, <laughs> yeah. So, siguro, and I'll start na lang. Um, actually, we can, we can uh, start inviting uh, Eunice and others to, to join us. Pero siguro, what I'll do is I'll talk about my, my experience first. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, as a student of uh, Dr. Alcala. So, hello, Eunice. Hi, sir. Hi, good afternoon. Good evening, sir. Uh, Hi, good afternoon. Uh, actually, malapit na mag-evening. Hello again up there. So, itong, itong segment na to, um, this will be uh, the time na you guys can, we, as the students ni Dr. Alcala can talk about uh, our experience uh, so with uh, Dr. Alcala. Na. Siguro I'll start na lang and then uh, after which um, si, we'll ask Eunice na, and then see si Abner. So um, and then later on I will also be asking um, si Ma'am Michelle, si Ma'am Mitch to show some pictures. Na. Uh, so, uh, um, let me begin by saying that the first time I, I, uh, well, I met si Dr. Alcala, literally physically met, was when I was um, still a student uh, doing masters at UP Los Banos, and, and yeah, and of course before that, um, we've. Um, uh, sa, sa class time in sa UPLB, we've been reading all of his papers, uh, his books uh, about herpetology, about land vertebrates, and so on. And uh, during that time, kasi, uh, uh, UPLB is also like Siliman University, sir. Ang UPLB is also doing a lot of uh, field work in wildlife biology or biodiversity. Yeah. And I think that's the one, two, two common good things between uh, Siliman University and uh, UP Los Banos, that uh, they are training people to become naturalists. And uh, I don't know if you remember, sir, uh, uh, I sent you letters uh, during the 1990s. Pa ito. I think you were still uh, the secretary of DNR. Yeah, at the time. Under the under uh, yeah, after uh, under President Fidel Ramos, no? and I sent you letters uh, using uh, by post snail mail, kunto again, and I don't know you guys, especially you mga younger people, if you if you were able to experience that, you know, sending letter letters posts, you know, talagang nakasulat sa 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 paper and then an envelope, and then uh in the post office and i actually sent you 
uh, about six or seven of these letters. And I don't know if you were able to read any of them, but um, uh, I, I can vividly remember na, uh, when we were having class at UPLB, again, I was doing master's at that time. I, I think this was 1993. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, you suddenly showed up in our, in our class, uh, UP Las Banas, a building, and you went there and you were with uh, yeah, your uh, colleagues from or um, mga buddies, you know. Uh, I think uh, you were with your bodyguards at that time. Um, yes, uh, and then you you uh, suddenly showed up in our hallway, and yeah, na, na nakita ka na ng mga tao doon, our professors and our uh, my, my classmates in class and they were pretty surprised and they were also pretty amazed that you showed up and actually if you i don't know if you also recall now you you gave an impromptu lecture in herpetology so, <laughs> what did i say at that time i forgot <laughs> Well, I actually, I can, what I can recall, sir, because uh, you, Diba, we worked out and I, you became eventually one of my advisors during yeah. masters. The other, the other ones are, see, uh, I like to mention her name, Academician Virginia, Virginia Cuevas. Yes, yes, Virginia. Yeah, and yeah, see, Mam G. Yeah. Uh, uh, you, by I, the way, you are one of his favorite, her favorites. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, sir. Uh, Seguro. And, uh, she's, uh, she's a nice person. We always get together when we meet in the last uh, meetings. Yeah, she's very charming. Eh? And I think she has the sweetest smile sa, sa among uh, women, I, ladies I know. And then see the late professor uh, Pete Albiola. Well, Peter Albiola, uh, Peter Albiola yeah, I, was my colleague actually. Uh -huh. We did to, we did work together in some islands in the Visayas. And he's Peter also a native of Cebu, right, eh, sir? Si, si Prof. Peter Albiola. Oh, Peter Albiola. Yeah. What happened so, to him? He just died suddenly? Uh, well, uh, many years ago, na rin po, eh, sa, sa Las Banas. Rin po. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so actually, because um, uh, you were my thesis advisor, and if you ask me, well, the way you asked me what was your reaction then, what did you tell me? Uh, actually, the I, I'll never forget it, because when I showed you my manuscript, because you asked me to give you a, a note, uh, uh, like a working paper about my thesis. So I mm -hmm. gave you a two or three pages of uh, concept paper for my master's th thesis topic. And you said that, by golly, Arvin, your your grammar is really bad. Yeah, but definitely I learned a lot. No? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I think it's only right f fully to, to, you know, to, for for us students, um, to really do our do our best eh, to to be able to to um diba? to to become better, diba? Well, you, you actually you have you have become better by writing all the other papers that you have published. Yeah. <laughs> so, pre, you, you have the ano lang naman yan, eh, diba? Sorry, uh, uh, oh, and, and uh, one thing about being a mentor like you, because you really have to give inspiration. Eh? You you really have to to, to yeah. serve as an inspiration to other people. So, so, pa. so siguro I'll ask naman si Eunice, because she's the youngest dito, uh, about her <laughs> about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and her I being remember a you were the one who recommended her. Yeah. Right? <laughs> okay. Eunice, so, tell us your story. So when she brought uh, up sir. your name, okay na ko da yun. <laughs> okay, Eunice. Uh, so, um, yes, sir. Um, I actually, 
Um, I think it was two meetings with you, sir, uh, Dr. Alcala, because I was um, doing illustrations for for Sir Jasmine's, and so when he heard na I wanted to apply for Seliman University, and and then Sir Jasmine said, I know, um, did you want to meet? Um, Dr. Alcala and I, I was, and I was like, yeah, sure, sure. And then, so yung first time na meeting, it was very unexpected. I was here sa sa Antipor, <laughs> and then nag uh, nagtext lang bigla si Sir Jasmus na sabi niya, hello, um, pupunta tito si si Dr. Alcala sa Natmo. Are you free? To so, say, okay, sige, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> so yeah, nagmadali ako from Antipor. <laughs> To Manila, to, um, to see you, to see you, Doctor Akela. And then the second meeting was very crucial. It was during, um, no book launch, no sir. And then that was when you asked me to pass, uh, to submit, uh, to send you a, uh, a proposal. And that was when, yeah, I sent the proposal about yung sa calories, and. And from from then on, na na kasi yung um wait a little thing about my thesis is that yung sa calories and um they're uh, they're often seen as 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 um souvenirs and um little is known about their research, so yeah um I looked into that and then. Um, fortunately, Dr. Alcala was very um, interested in these things, and so um, it was such an honor to to be um, to have you as my advisor, Dr. Alcala, and to also um, na na si Dr. Alcala din yung nagfund ng aking masters, which is uh, mind blowing. <laughs> so, yeah. Abner yeah. also helped you with the design of your... And with the help of Sir Abner then. <laughs> the design of so, your yes, thesis. The study site is in... Uh, the study site. My Abner was home uh, responsible for hometown. Yes, home sir. Home barangay. Nice. Nice. to represent my playground. Basically, the mangrove area there was my childhood playground, so I immediately suggested to Dr. Alcala that about cowries, no problem. There's a place in my barangay where she can do her master's thesis. Yeah. And it's accessible and very safe. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yes. so you need um, I think that's the first yes, sir. comprehensive study on cowries in the, in the desires at least. Or <laughs> so what are you doing now, uh, Yunis? Uh, do you have a project uh, in which you can continue your uh, involvement? Uh, I, um, I'm currently not in anything yet, but but yeah, I'm. I've, I've actually previously worked as a project staff for um, before USAID Fishery program, and. It focuses on the, um, it promotes um, young fisheries in South Negros, and it's actually, actually a great experience. That's but then great. currently I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I'm looking for other um, opportunities. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Are you planning to go into uh, graduate school, paren, uh, higher higher education, Eunice? Uh, if um, given the opportunity and the chance, I'd yeah. still pursue it. So, so Eunice, anong, um, anong, what what can you uh, what can you share sa mga you know, other young people out there uh, about you know like what you've experienced? I know what, what, what can you uh, what can you advise them you know with regards to 
you know, pursuing masters or studies or you know, like uh, meeting meeting a famous person. Kaya ano ano yung personal advice mo sa kanila, uh, given your experience na. Um. Uh. Um. Med- medyo cheesy siya pero <laughs> um, if you really <laughs> okay <lang>. truly <laughs> If you really truly believe in something na talagang passion mo siya, then you really need to work hard for it, to fight for it, and to really let others know that this is really what you want to do. And so you have to get it out there na this is this is what I feel na should be out there. So, so yeah. Yeah, just go for it, na. Huh? Go for your dreams. So, so Eunice, thank you, ah. So, so ano naman? Tatanungin naman natin si Kuya Abner. Abner, uh, before we go into the next topic naman about uh, Dr. Alcala, no? Uh, siguro, just tell us about your experience with him. Paano kayo first time nag-meet uh, And you know, Although na-mention mo na kanina yung, ano, na, yung, maybe just uh, yung mga other stories behind that. Yes, yeah, so uh, with my first project at Wapen, uh, Dr. Alcala immediately arranged uh, a small uh, scholarship for him, uh, for me at Siliman. Mm-hmm. And it, it, was, it was not so easy because you're working at the same time and also pursuing academic studies so field work was balik you know but i learned a lot uh, from dr alcala through actual involvement and so when it comes to writing uh, our uh, my experience is that it's more into um independent learning mm-hmm. so, uh, instead of him tutoring me most of the time uh, he'll just uh, give me some task and, and see uh, we'll just meet and discuss what's the status you know and then of course point out some uh, weakness of my draft uh, most of the time, it's on the again, grammar and the English uh, writing s- uh, skills. No? So I think I, through time, I, I kind of improved partly through Dr. Alcala's um, advice. And when we write manuscripts together, uh, it's kind of weird because we don't just exchange drafts, but uh, sometimes you will sit down with me. It's, I'm, I'm writing directly on the computer, and he's right beside me, watching what <laughs> I will what input you're into the <laughs> into the draft. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is one of my my paper that uh, it was under his herpetology class that this paper, the concept of this paper was developed and um, it was my requirement actually under him mm-hmm. to publish one paper that's one requirement under his class <laughs> not we, we don't have uh, Exams, uh, regular exams, but uh, the main task is to produce a publication, a published article. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, it was uh, just a simple paper, uh, just trying to assess the vulnerability of uh, Philippine amphibians. There are more than 100 of them uh, based on some criteria try to figure out which ones are prone to the negative effects of 
uh, climate climatic changes just uh, prolonged drought and uh, extreme uh, climate conditions so yeah and uh, my thesis was different one it was not on herpetology but it was uh, on fish. the development of some six changing coral reef uh, fishes nice, and, nice. <laughs> uh, dr alcala was one of the uh, <clears throat> co advisors on fish and uh, these are the parrot fishes the mulmul and the grouper three species mm. of six changing species and the main my main advisor is Dr. Rene Abisamis, and uh, it was kind of kind of difficult for me because it's a new topic, and we needed a lot of. There are some uh, most of the time it's on examining fish gonads, but majority of the data came from survey data. Dr. Abisamis also helped. Help a lot, and we are now in the writing stage for the, the first paper of, under my master's thesis. And Dr. Alcala awesome. and uh, Professor Gariras, is, uh, they are involved with this uh, in the drafting of this paper. <laughs> and uh, okay. I would like to take this opportunity to also thank. Uh, Dr. Rene Abisamis for his patience yeah. <laughs> and all the help uh, he poured into me, uh, both professional and personal. <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much. So, what is it? Are, are you publishing that paper now or are you ready for publication? This is more. Yes, uh, Rene and I are in the uh, writing stage, all the preparations. Doctor Abisamis, Doctor Rini Abisamis, he's one of the leading experts now on marine protected areas. I was fortunate also, uh, marine protected area connectivity in the Visayas. So again, most of the time we're doing field work, catch fish, uh, getting some fin clips, and this preparation for DNA analysis. Uh, Dr. Al uh, Dr. Abisamis took care of that uh, project. And yeah. <coughs> I learned quite a lot <laughs> on the recent approaches, recent uh, concepts in the marine protected area topic. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Abner. Uh, definitely, uh, sa mga younger people out there, uh, uh, siguro ang advice lang, number one, listen to your advisor. Okay, makinig kayo doon. And then, uh, collaborate, and then publish. Kasi ito yung mga natutunan natin sa, sa aming advisor. Pero, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, ano, uh, thank you, Eunice and Abner. Pero don't, don't go yet. Kasi uh, final two questions for Dr. Alcala. Kasi murag uh, kapoy na si sir. Kasi it's nearly two hours na yung ating interview. Sir, before we let you go, uh, we have two final questions for you. Uh, number one is, uh, if you look back, uh, what kind of advice, if any, would you give to your younger self? So that's the, 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 the first one. Um, Again, if you look back, uh, what advice, if any, would you give to your younger self? Well, I realized that uh, when I was younger, I had full of plenty of full, plenty of energy to do work, and so I would uh, uh, spend plenty of time for my field work and. Uh, tended to harass <laughs> the other guys who would not follow my advice. 
and, and so I I, I met I uh, met this problem with my own son or or complained that if uh, he likes to see me he would like to have an appointment with me first <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought that I would go easy you know at my own time to really supervise anybody who works with me and that advise it not not rush him but they are very uh, very uh, forcibly or uh, require his work right away you have to give him time because everybody has his own time except for those that are really what we call somewhat lazy because there are graduate students that are lazy some of them don't uh, don't really care about timing so uh, but only those few individuals that behave that way uh, i would like to say to it that you have to be fair with graduate students give them enough time to uh, do their work at their own pace mm -hmm. see, without forcing them and that's my advice if i were young because i went when i was young i was too brush uh, i wanted to do things right away i wanted to finish the job yesterday or tomorrow <laughs> what not right away this is the, the rashness but you can see that uh, from my number of publications i have so many publications because were, i had that kind of behavior so i think i would go easy and help these young people realize their own potential through their own means that one thing to, i would like to be done if i were young again and really go easy on graduate students now for uh graduate students like abner or uh, uh Eunice, I, I i did that mostly i think yeah see uh, let them go on their own time scale in doing their work mm -hmm. that's what i will advise but i have to see to it that they they do their work well and they keep good records of their of the research and finish the research within a period of time whether it's one year or two years or five years or 10 years and write them up and publish in journals that's the way i have been doing and during my younger days i just had plenty of publications in fact abner how many did i have <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't keep track 280 and something uh, sorry, 200 plus. Cases. 280 sir. <coughs> yeah, you have a person who has that number of publications during his lifetime. <laughs> it, it's a, uh, um, that's why I, right now I have two boxes here of pub, of uh, papers that I have published, whether in reference journals or in uh, social journals. They are all there. 200. 70 plus uh, including books of course yeah. and uh, I, I cannot do it and i will not do it if i were young again <laughs> <laughs> don't follow that right now i'm closing to 92 and uh, i still have a tendency to really push people too hard but i i think i'm learning quite a lot to keep them take them in easier give them easy time so they will produce more and they will like their work the important thing is how to keep your attention to what you're doing yeah. and that's what i did for the monitoring of marine protected areas remember we began 19, uh, working on marine protected areas in 1970s up to now we're still doing the monitoring <laughs> how many years <laughs> So, so which, it's uh, yeah. kind of, well, you see, let's have long time researches rather than one or two yes, years. Yes. Long term ecological research. Yeah. Monitoring what you're doing for, for periods of decades. Just like 
what we expect from protected areas. The, you can see the results of protected areas in decades, not in one year, not in two years, not in three years, but in decades. That's how I what I learned from doing marine protected area work. Mm -hmm. Sir, which brings us to the final question for you. Um, so how do you see the future of Philippine biodiversity and conservation of the environment, natural resources, uh, given your decades and decades of experience? How do you see the, the future? Well, uh, I'm sorry to say that it looks like uh, uh, the future of Philippine biodiversity is not too bright in the future. <laughs> not too bright because uh, primarily because, well, aside from human behavior, that needs to be straightened out. Look at the long-term effects. You have increase in temperatures, climate change, sea level rise. They will all affect our biodiversity in the marine ecosystems. They will all destroy shallow coral reefs because the shallow coral reefs were heat up to above 30 degrees beyond 30 degrees and we're already seeing evidence of that even in our coral reefs in the country sometimes you see white you can see coral reefs that look white looks like snow underwater mm -hmm. and that's, those are bleaching effects because of high temperatures and all the all the shallow coral reefs will probably succumb to this destruction by climate change and heat and high temperatures in the long term. And that's why I am proposing that we look at deep coral reefs and protect them because deep coral reefs, we hope that cool water will continue to flow to continue to flow over them in the in the, uh, the future time, future ages from now. I hope that they succeed. And with the succeed, success of these coral reefs, we'll have enough fish that are found in these reefs. And remember, our coastal areas, our seas, were 100 meters Right now, we're 100 meters the level compared to the levels during Pleistocene times. Our our seas were were uh, were lower at that time, 100 meters. That's the finding by geologists. So some of the fish that are now in the upper levels of seawater uh, uh, are are still are still found in the deeper portions of the ocean. And this is our break, this is our hope that this will not be disturbed even in the, the, in the face of climate change and heating up the sea and rising levels of sea level. This is uh, our climate change. Sir, how, how so, about the terrestrial environment? Right, the, right. Our, our, rain, our remaining forests our remaining, our habitats well, and other habitats. The remaining forest, our remaining forest. Well, by the way, look at the forest of California. Those are not tropical rainforests. See, the area in California uh, has low humidities and dry. So they can cut, cut fire right away. Mm -hmm. See, they burn. Look at the situation in California. Every year, more areas are burned. Pity the Manium Californians. Well, they don't have tropical rainforest. Our tropical rainforests are really moist. You, you take a look at the difference between exotic species, which we do not like to have in the country. 
but DNR started it. You have all these exotic species planted in the country. That was before my time as Secretary of DNR. I didn't do that when I was Secretary. In fact, I did a different thing. I encouraged planting of the endemic species, including the dipterocarps, because much of our forests are real moist with plenty of moisture, either whether rainy season or dry season, they are moist. And our biodiversity in this rainforest, they are alive at temperatures of about 21, 22 degrees centigrade Celsius. I showed that by writing a paper on the lizards, the out in this tropical rainforest. They keep, they, they are active, low temperatures. And I hope that this, our forest, our tropical rainforest shall be kept moist, even though there is dry season, because they hold enough water or moisture throughout the year. Not like temperate forests that are in dry areas where they easily burn. Uh, tropical rainforests are different. With uh, three layers that keep the sunlight away from the lower portions of that forest. And with this condition, we hope that some species will survive. But I'm not too sure. Because our tropical rainforest has dwindled to a little more than 1,000 hectares. Me, you, you blame all those guys who cut our forests because of money. They were so, in the 1950s, they were, they were cutting forests left and right, the negros. The large trees that were 30, 40, 50 years old were cut down and no more tropical rainforest occurs in many areas for negros, except the rainforest in, in Negros Occidental. There is, a, there is a fine tropical rainforest there that was protected by the governor. And that, that is the kind of thing we should endeavor to do. Plant more endemic species like the pterocarp, uh, the family, many species, eight or ten genera, ten species of the pterocarp, and keep our forest moist. It's good for us, it's good for the biodiversity because there's water all the time. We'll, we'll have fresh water all the time flowing from our forest. Where does the water come from, which we drink? From tropical rainforest. Not from any forest, not from pine forests, but from tropical rainforests. That's the key. And we should do that. So right now, let's tell all these guys, the foresters and all the department of, any, of uh, forestry, the DNR, to encourage planting of our endemic species, not the exotic ones. Cut them all out, cut them down on these exotic ones. That's what I gave an instruction to Lake Blesayo. Cut all the exotic species there and let the, the endemic species, native endemic species, remain <coughs> and keep the forest moist. It will not burn because no. it's wet, even if it's during dry season. Mm -hmm. So, that sir, so may, yeah. So, so in short, sir, may meron pa namang hope, no? We, we there's still redemption, naman na. Uh, ang situation ng Filipinos. Well, we hope because there is some time, but it's not the future is not too bright because there are always people that would like it. I think we control the behavior of some people. Don't get don't get income from the forest no more. Let them grow. <laughs> okay, that's what I feel, and that's why I said the situation in the future. It's not too bright. But anyway, we have a lot of young people now listening here and um, who are very, very active now, uh, about uh, okay. uh, issues in, about well, regarding the environment. Hope. So, that's our hope. Yeah. Let me do something. Our young people. Don't yeah. Knowledge don't into action. Yeah. Don't All right. So, sir, um, again, uh, well, that was the, the last question. So, segment na ito. 
Actually, uh, we still have questions po, um, that you may need to answer. Pero do you want to take a short break before the question and answers from oh, the, sure, the, sure. the before answering the questions from our viewers? But uh, there were a couple lang, uh, konti lang naman po sir to, to Oh, sure, sure, sure. sure. Go ahead, go ahead. So, okay. so mag break muna tayo, just a short uh, minutes. Uh, is that okay, Michelle, Cynthia? We still have enough time, no? Um, mag break muna tayo, kahit uh, two minutes lang, and then dun sa question and answer uh, yeah. portion na tayo. So thank you, uh, Eunice and Abner. Ha? Uh, you, you, you don't need to leave, pa, pero you, you can join us para dun sa question and answer portion. Okay, so we'll be back. Okay. So, sinong questions yung itatanong natin? More than two hours now. Are you fine? Two hours now? Mga two hours na tayong nakaupo eh. Wala pa kayong uh, nothing, nothing, not feeling bad or stuff. Nothing, nothing. Kasi yung likod ko masakit na rin po eh. <laughs> anyway, uh, just a few questions. <laughs> I'll read them and then uh, uh, so, so you may answer them. Pero Sigurd, so before uh, for before the final questions, uh, let me just uh, 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 them, um, choose them. Okay. Uh, questions. Uh, this one is from uh, Wilhelm Tan. 
do you think the research and people's re re reception on reptiles are getting better compared to before? Uh, so basically, this is about perception of the people on reptiles. And which among the species you discovered have are, are you most proud of? <laughs> so. uh, actually, my my stand is that all biodiversity, I mean, all the species of amphibians and reptiles in the country are all good. There are only a few species, less than 10 of snakes, for example, that are venomous. See? But many of those uh, species are, are neutral. They, are, they, they do not harm human beings. In fact, there was a title of a book that was written that I read, Kinship with Biodiversity. Man's mm -hmm. Kinship with Biodiversity. We are all together in this. We are all live. Live beings, including biodiversity. See? So we hope that we can keep them intact, whatever, whatever we have right now, even though some species are near extinction. Now, some of our species are nearing extinction because of too much, well, cutting the forests, for example, uh, cutting their habit, habitats and uh, uh, in environment, keep, uh, the, uh, the degenerates, uh, the same thing with coral reefs, the coral reef structure becomes degraded. So the environment is important for biodiversity to thrive. One ecologist has pointed it out. Two Australian biologists have pointed it out. And environment is important. So we maintain this tropical rainforest environment of ours. And maintain the tropical the coral reefs that are found in tropical seas. This is the only thing that we have to do really most in order to conserve our biodiversity. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, another question here from Katya Milad. Um, well, he she thanks you for sharing with us your journey. I am, uh, this is Katya, I am a veterinary medicine student, Po, and I'm interested in reptiles. What are the challenges that we should be expecting when we do field work on reptiles? Well, you know, reptiles we are, are common uh, common species that are found in zoos. And I really, I, I suggest that we put as many of our uh, reptiles in zoos. Yeah. And we do not, incidentally, we, we don't want mu museums now. We, are, we do not have, we do not want pickled museums, pickled specimens in museums. We want to keep a live, a live museum, if it is such a term. Let, let's, let's keep our animals alive and show it to our people and show They're, that they can enjoy looking at this species. Especially and, in their uh, natural habitat now. Yeah, that's the, uh, that, that's what I think, that we, we, we really should keep this uh, uh, species uh, intact, alive if possible, so that we keep them away from extinction. Yes. Okay, a few more. Um, uh, well, this is about um, med, uh, well, this is the same as experience as yours, sir. Um, uh, her, uh, there's this guy, Joseph Kirona, and he has students, BS biology students, who are having a hard time deciding whether to pursue medicine, MD, or uh, doing research. What can you advise them? Well, medicine. If you pursue medicine, look at some areas that are underfunded, under undermanned. There are specialties of medicine that need to be need to be improved. The the, the, the scientists that work certain areas of medicine should that should be improved. Uh, uh, if, but I, I think if he has the, he can he can be both, he can be both a an MD and a, 
uh, specialize on on uh, amphibians and reptiles. I, I had a, a collaborator last time in the Navy, U.S. Navy. He, he was a he was an officer of the Navy, and he was a, 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 a herpetologist. See, so in it, you can have two professions at the same time. See, I, I hope that uh, uh, does not if if he has uh, uh, money, of course, uh, if he has family as as uh, as well to do, uh, he can take both if possible, because there are people that have two professions. Some of yes. some of them, <laughs> it's possible to do that. Yeah, true. I agree, sir. Uh, so you can do both, especially now, ngayong, uh, during this time. Uh, and then there's a question here about dolomite sand in Manila Bay. Eh? Pero I don't, I don't think you you would want to get into that, sir. So, siguro ito na lang. Galing kay Mailay, uh, were you able to return to Kaliling and its protected landscape? Yeah. Uh, no, no, I have not been there for a long time. But I am told that that, that protected, uh, not landscape, but the rock protected marine area there is working very well. Oh, that's great. But then, the landscape. I have, not, I have not gone back for some time because of this COVID prohibiting us from traveling from place to place. <clears throat> yeah, so yeah, that answers the question. Anna. So, so uh, do na lang yung questions natin. Pero, sir, before we, we say goodbye to the audience, can I personally ask you to uh, to help me greet our colleagues from UP Los Baños? Yeah. Uh, yeah hello, hello, ma'am, sir. Uh, Andy, yeah. JC, uh, Ma'am Leti, love you. <laughs> and of course, other colleagues from there, uh, Sila Pao, Sila Philip, and so on. Uh, hello, UPLB. Uh, uh, definitely, uh, you're not forgotten. I know. And uh, a shout out sa mga estudyante namin sa UST Herp Lab. Hello, all of you. I won't, we won't need to mention your names kasi madami kayo. Uh, Herp Lab U, uh, sa UST. And of course, my co- of the Philippines. Hello. Hello there. Ingat kayo palagi. Especially during this uh, pandemic times. And of course, from the our colleagues at the National Museum. Uh, sir, any uh, any greetings, final words before we wrap up um, this show, uh, which is now more than two hours. I hope you're doing okay. That's all right. Well, it, uh, it, it's good to have this uh, Wild Bruce uh, program uh, to allow us uh, senior uh, senior <laughs> researchers about to about to disappear from this earth to no. put out our, our views so for young people to take over and it, it is part of the cycle of life and I would uh, be happy to have many scientists in the country filling the gaps in the science areas of the country. And look at the situations where we need you know, during this COVID uh, pandemic. <clears throat> we we know there are, we, there are, we have many gaps in the scientific aspects of the Philippines, and I hope that uh, our students will take note of this. Which areas are we deficient in experts, <coughs> and which area are failed? Maybe medicine, for example. Well, to my well, my my family has plenty of. Their children are medical men, medical mm -hmm. persons, and uh, I, I don't know, maybe there, there will be too many medical pe people in the country. Uh, but I hope they choose their specialties very well and find out and, and, and embrace the specialties that, that, are lacking, that are lacking in the country. Like, for example, many of our hospitals do not have virologists to take a look at the diseases caused by viruses. Mm -hmm. We don't have many. We do some be, 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 virologists, those, those that are practicing virology, uh, uh, practical aspects, are MDs. They took maybe a course or two in virology or something like that, but not as a real, real specialty uh, profession. So there are probably gaps in our, in our medis, medical areas in the country. It should be filled up. And the science, 
there are still, well, you have participated in the amphibians of the Philippines. There are how many species now? 120, 110? Um, <laughs> marami pa tayo, sir, describe. <laughs> so let, let's go ahead with that. And, and uh, really, uh, look at those because there are still many that have escaped detention, detection. So we hope that they will do it. Yeah, those that are up on coming herpetologists. Uh, yeah, because <clears throat> I, I I think we, we should add more uh, herpetologists and experts in uh, amphibians and reptiles. Uh, we have not looked at our uh, marine species, for example. We have one marine species that cannot bite, for example. Does not bite. So it, the, the, one, one, one of our sea snakes cannot bite people because the, the, in the mouth, is, the gape is small. It cannot bite people. But there are others that are dangerous. So maybe we should look at that and things. How about the cobras uh, or the ones that are venomous? There are how many species of them? Three or four? Things like those. Uh, <coughs> Sir Dibale, um, uh, you've inspired a lot of people already, younger people, and I'm sure uh, yung mga viewers natin tonight, tonight na, uh, will have will be more inspired to take up uh, marine biology and or herpetology, and or to become naturalists. Again, you can do, you can become naturalist naman even if you're into other uh, fields or other disciplines. Right, right. All right, sir, with, with that, uh, we thank you. Uh, it's a really great honor to be speaking with you again. And we will see you in the next, uh, hopefully we can work more papers in the next 10 years, Papa. And yes, you can yeah, do it. Yeah, <laughs> you, you've, been, uh, you've been a great inspiration to many of us and we thank you, Papa. Uh, Dagang salamat for, for the inspiration and the kindness. So, and... Yeah, so that's our closing. And um, siguro yung final word po ninyo, kaya na po yung mag-close before. Uh... Well, this symposium has been great because we are talking uh, from experience and point out some of the things we have to do for the near future and see to it that we uh, try to manage our uh, land and marine biodiversity and to, to manage them in such a way that few, if any, will become extinct in the near future. And we hope that we'll be active in uh, putting out information about our amphibians and reptiles because many wrong information is circulating among our people. Like uh, snakes are all venomous and they should be killed. But uh, baranid lizards should be eaten because they are not good for anything else but uh, things like those so I, I i think let's let's preserve them because they are part of our kin the kinship of man and and biodiversity animals and man so let's remember that and keep the flame of conservation burning all the time so we will be we will succeed in some aspects of of biodiversity conservation and many thanks to all of you for all of this uh, uh, to, for this discussion today. Uh, and we hope that some of you can lead the discussions in, in the near future. Every year you do it, we hope. Uh, this wild Bruce concept, things like those. So we hope that you are all well. And thank you very much for including me in this the program for today. Thanks again. <clears throat> the great, yeah, the great honors is ours. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, Doctor National Scientist Alcala, and we love you. So don't, yeah, marami na grandma yeah. Thank you, thank you, sir. Yeah. And then magpapaalam oh, lang po ako uh, just to make announcements. Uh, all right, so that was uh, National Scientist Angel Alcala. Such a pleasure and honor to be uh, with him, doing the conversation with him. And just a few announcements before we totally close. Uh, announcement po ang Danny S. Balete grant. Deadline is October 30, just a few more days. 
So submit your your proposals now and do the work, do the research, and let's make a change. Let's keep the flame, the fire burning. Uh, we really need to make a, to create a critical mass, uh, an army of biodiversity uh, researchers and specialists. And special thanks, shout out, thanks to uh, Worth the Health Foods and Nipa Brews Craft Beer uh, for supporting uh, this episode and the last episode. So they've been supporting uh, Wild Brews uh, for two consecutive episodes now. And then do follow us, uh, follow the BCSP social media account. So like, follow, subscribe, and TikTok. May TikTok ba ang BCSP? Parang wala pa, no? Mukhang kailangan nyo mag-create ng TikTok. So. Right. So with that, uh, anything else? I'll just write, uh, walang TikTok. Okay. So again, uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone. I hope you had an um, enjoyable evening. It is now 6.36 p.m. Uh, Saturday, and my name is Arvin C. Diasmas, signing off. Nadie la pregunta